With more and more authors joining class action lawsuits against OpenAI for copyright infringement and the Hollywood writers and actors strike going on for months now, there's a lot to talk about in the business of entertainment. How can we make sense of AI and automation in the entertainment industry specifically? That's why my guest this week is Rob Kingians. As president and CEO of Yellow Brick, Rob empowers the next generation of talent in the entertainment and creative arts industries. Yellow Brick is a platform that creates online learning experiences in partnership with top universities and brands. This conversation will surely help make sense of a ton of headlines these days. But first, welcome to this week's episode of Make Sense, a video podcast that simplifies complex issues. There are a lot at the intersection of tech and people. So whether you're totally hyped on artificial intelligence and ready for that robot to take over, or you want to crawl into a cave after deleting all of your social media accounts, I don't blame you. I'm here with my guests to help make sense of what's going on so you can design yourself into the future. My name is Lindsay Tabus. I am a product market fit strategist, innovation consultant, and venture fundraising advisor. If you're new here, subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. So let's make sense of the business of entertainment. Rob, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's awesome. I'm so glad you're here. I know we had a few reschedules, so it's great to be back yeah. on the phone with you. So let's start with our seg first segment, Crystal Ball. What does the future hold? This is where I call out interesting predictions for this year that other people made. And then my my guests, the experts, they tell us their hot take. So I'm going to fire off some headlines. And I want you to say, like, if you know nothing about it, say, yes, I want that to happen. Or no, please yeah. do not. Um, if you know anything about it, say, yes, that's happening. And maybe you can give us some insights or no not happening in 2023. I know we only have like a couple months left. Yeah. Um, maybe give us a timeline if you if you know about it. Okay. 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 So Yellow Brick, it's an ed tech product and you've been in the business of education for well over a decade or two at this point. And mm -hmm. um, big headline, the school to work path will be turned on its head. So companies are dropping degree requirements and colleges are facing an unprecedented enrollment cliff. So competition amongst them is high. Mm -hmm. True or false? Where do you stand on this? I, I think it's true, um, but I am confident that like, usually it's more targeted at like universities are not relevant to the workforce. I'm confident that they will adapt over time. I think the people that say that they're going to fail or collapse. Um, I just don't see that. Previously was an executive at Cornell University. If you think brands, like think the Fortune 500, there's very few Fortune 500, four, five, Fortune 500 brands that have been around for 100 plus years. If you look at academic institutions, there's a whole bunch of them. So mm -hmm. I think that proves that they stand the test of time. I think they are slow to adapt, but I think they probably will adapt. All right. Um, Cool. Yeah, I know that it, the school to work path does not work for everyone, uh, but it, it's quite an entrenched and established uh, system. And people yeah. with college degrees are far, there's far less of them unemployed than people without them. Yeah. So. And we can talk maybe later too, but like our business, we kind of, um, we're kind of unique in ed tech where we see ourselves as partners with brands and, and academic institutions. So I think in my market, a lot of people tend to be were either for or against. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of see it more as blended, like the two yeah. working together. Yeah. yeah, and you know what? There's been blended, ex like uh, academic initiatives for a very long time, and yeah, we'll talk about yeah. that in a sure. later segment. Okay, uh, how about this one? I haven't brought it up in a while. So, tech enabled immersive teaching. So virtual reality and augmented reality, VR, AR, bringing immersive experiences to students. Yep. Yeah. I, what do you know? I think it has a lot of possibility in the future. I, I was personally like very bullish and excited about it. I think that like even with Apple's latest headset, which is cool, it's not affordable and they still are pretty heavy put in your head. So I think, I think the technology is really cool and probably will be in learning. I think it's a hardware issue personally. Mm. And I think until it becomes something that's more wearable that you can actually like 
I'll give you an example. Like during the, the pandemic, I bought an Oculus for my kids. Mm-hmm. And as cool as it is, having that on your head for over an hour is just really not practical. So I, right. I think that's the the challenge right now in that mm-hmm. space. Yeah, it's uh, how do we get the price of that headset to a point where, you know, what do they distribute Chromebooks at a lot of schools these yeah. days? Like we need to get it to that point. Yeah, exactly. I also had heard something that the Apple uh, glasses, they kind of pulled back on um, production, their predicted kind of sales and pulled back on their production. So do, yeah. you, do you know anything about that? And if you don't, it's okay. I've heard, I've heard they, they have, but I, I think their issue is the price point, right? It's just not a, you know, average consumer can't afford that. Um, and then I think if you're a, like a software developer, you know, why would you develop apps for it if the market share is really small? So I think that's, that's still a challenge in the market. I think once I get solved, then I think it'll have a, a huge impact in a lot of fields, especially yeah. for training. And that's kind of why Facebook's metaverse efforts didn't really take off either because everything is built for Oculus and the Oculus, as you said, is still. Yeah, and I don't know if you like I have one. I mean, you're lucky if the battery without a huge battery pack will last, you know, beyond maybe a couple hours if you're lucky. So I think that those are things I think had to get solved. Like I'm kind of disappointed that of all things that hardware hasn't been solved to this time frame, you know, but it will, I think, eventually. Maybe I'll have to get someone on the hardware side to explain yeah. why it's still uh, not uh, at a, an affordable price point. Cool. All right. So this is on the tech side of your experience. So AI-powered code generators will have a profound effect on developers' productivity. So there's a bunch of new tools that will allow developers to focus on the more complex and innovative tasks while kind of automating repetitive and mundane aspects of the software development process. Yeah, I so I do believe that will be true eventually. Um, as someone who's kind of dabbled, like like say Code Interpreter, which mm-hmm. uh, OpenAI came out with, it's super impressive, but I don't think it's probably something that's going to create like clean code you know, at the moment, but I do, I think that, and I think a lot of developers, you know, are not embracing it. I think that eventually it's going to become part of the workflow of any coder where it can help you troubleshoot, help you QA. It's going to get smarter and smarter over time, but I personally haven't really seen the, you know, AI is going to create this app for you and it's going to run perfectly. Um, I, I agree with most software developers will say like, it's probably a whole lot of garbage code, at the moment, if you totally relied on it. Well, what I think is interesting is uh, someone told me last week, they said uh, by a lot of developers using uh, these coding AI tools, the kind of opus of content that these large language models were trained on, Stack Overflow. Yeah is not there's not enough new content being added to stack overflow to continue to train these models because if people have questions they're going straight to you know chat gpt or code generator or something else i think the challenge too is like like if you probably like you like anybody who's like dabbling with ai like i've tried to do some pretty technical stuff and kind of test it um the prompts are super important right like i'll give you example like i was just curious with um a third-party api could I use Code Interpreter to actually write the script um, to do something with a third-party API? It was able to do some stuff, but if you go down a path where it got confused, you can spend a lot more time trying to untangle that prompt that went off off the rails. So I think some of it is interface as well, right? Yeah. Like, like I think it has the smarts to do it, but I'm not sure there's you know the perfect interfaces. And obviously, you're an expert when it comes to user experience. <laughs> I think some of it is there has to be front-end development. For some of these AI tools too to work effectively. Well, sure. Chat, the chat is just an interface, right? And the prompts that you give it is the interaction that you have with it, uh, the the back end. But here's here's a question. Yeah. Is AI really fulfilling its you know prophecy potential if prompt engineering is a, has skill that people have to develop? Right. In that people have to speak differently to get the 
robot to give yeah. it the thing that it that we want? I, I think it's a nuanced answer, right? In some ways, like for very simple tasks, it's amazing, right? Like I'll give you this, like for our business, like um, transcription, mm -hmm. right? Uh, OpenAI has um, a, a, you know speech language thing. Um, that's incredibly sped things up. You don't have to really give it a whole lot of knowledge to transcribe something. Sure. I think if you get into complex, like multi-step things, mm -hmm. that's where, you know, at the moment you do have to really kind of like get in the head of how AI works and try to avoid making a mistake along the way Yeah. because it's super, super hard to tell to go back three steps, you know, right. when, when you get in that kind of path. So I think it's like, it's in its infancy, but I... I'm not always people just because there are issues with it going to say like, it's not going to catch up. I think it is going to oh, catch sure. up. Pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah, sure. It's just, it's more of a philosophical conversation yeah. is, yeah. is how much do we have to adjust for this thing that is supposed to present as yeah. human like, right. Yeah. Agree. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So software engineering will become more commoditized. So AI's ability to automate processes, maybe cover the 80% of tasks that don't really require strategy. It can generate insights. It can learn from vast amounts of data. It's led to a decrease in the time and resources required to develop software. So can, can and will software engineering become more commoditized? Uh... I think it will in a way. I think there will be a greater need for like very experienced software engineers. Um, like I'll just give you an example. Like with our business is, you know, a lot of people might be familiar with Zapier mm -hmm. um, that does automation. Like there was a day in my career when I was like formerly a CTO where you'd have coders, you know, doing all this code to integrate third party systems. Um, right. Like even recently, Zapier, like we're super impressed with what they've done. Like they've used open AI where you can basically say, I'd like to do this. And it basically tries to say, here's the steps and the apps that go together to make that work. And you're basically just kind of polishing it. What, what I think a lot of AI is going to do is like for software developers is that they can focus less on those kind of things mm -hmm. and more on like true customer value. Like for us, we're an education company. I'd rather have our software developers use AI for things that are repetitive and commonplace and focus their attention on customer value. Right. So I think. I think there'll be more need for like very experienced developers. I think for like a lot of people that like in education, coding boot camps are a big thing. Mm -hmm. I think junior level programming, like on the masses, is probably going to see a change because of AI. But I think it's going to create a lot of opportunity for like, you know, pure, you know, senior level coders. Mm -hmm. or probably going to be even more demand, would be my yeah. guess. So one of the things I just noticed is that you use the word uh, programmers, engineers, and coders <laughs> to all refer to uh, this skill set of writing code and building software. Do you think that there is, is a need to distinguish uh, the engineer from the developer or coder? Uh, it, it could enge, engineers yeah. kind of been co-opted in tech as plain in used as plain language to talk yeah. to anyone that writes code, but it in other way in other industries it means something very specific with professional right. licensing and certification. Um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think probably sometimes it comes down to the size of the organization. Right. Because you can have engineers that are very focused on architecture and DevOps and, you know, scalability. Mm -hmm. From my standpoint, I think like the true like software engineer has to be someone that's very in tune with like the purpose and the why of what this app is supposed to do for the customer or the business. Mm -hmm. So I do think that AI is going to force a lot more developers to be, you know, like you're, you, you very much focus on like user experience. I think. Developers probably going to have to be a little more user experience focused than, you know, the prior term is like code monkeys, right? right? Lock, lock me in a room and I'll just code. I think AI is going to probably force a lot of traditional engineers, software developers to be much more customer centric of like what values it's bringing, which I think is a good thing, right? Um, for any organization. This might be real nuanced on my side uh, to say the type of activities that will get commoditized by AI are software development tasks, but there will be a need for software engineers for the strategy. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. Level. Yeah. I'm gonna. Like more, I'm like going my, to... I think you're like I think I think another way of saying it is I think you had to be a lot more tactical and strategic moving forward. Yeah. Right? 100%. Okay. So speaking about AI, going into our second segment, what do you know? So this is where us relatively intelligent tech ecosystem insiders discuss a hot mess that's made national news. We don't claim to be experts, but we probably know more than you do. And that's all that matters right now. So headline, Actor Stephen Fry says his voice was stolen from the Harry Potter audiobooks and replicated by AI and warns that this is just the beginning. So AI is at the center of Hollywood's biggest labor dispute in more than 50 years. What do you know? Uh, I mean, I do think it's a it's a huge legitimate issue. Um, I think like, you know, recently looks like strikes are getting resolved for like writers, probably actors uh, soon as well. Um, I think they've won a lot of rights with studios, but I think that it's going to be a huge issue where like anybody anywhere could replicate someone's voice or image. Um, like even our company, we, we own a school called Animation Mentor, which is an animation business. Um, I think it's, you know, very easy. People can use a 3D model, you know, or Epic's on Real Engine mm -hmm. and put someone else's voice or even image on that thing. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be a bit of a wild west. And I think in, you know, areas where it's really hard to go after your IP, I think that's going to be a struggle. Like I just recently, like in TikTok, there's, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, like a meme where they've taken some celebrities, uh, faces and voices and done interviews with like legitimate, like reporters where they thought they were interviewing the actual celebrity. Um, and they're using wow. like a lot of like, you know, off the shelf, like, you know, 3D kind of modeling software. But I, I think it's going to be a huge risk. I mean, I think that um, there's going to be a, a lot of lawsuits. I think if you're talent, you know, like you're an actor or your voice actor, I think you have reason to be legitimately concerned because maybe you can trust the studios with like a new agreement. But can you trust someone that's like the other side of the world that right. uses this for other purposes? Right. That's going to be the, the concern. So a friend of mine was creating marketing videos uh, for actually an education uh, company, but they they train, you know, estheticians and, and hairstylists and such. And she was able to take a Zoom recording, import it, and, and then use the voice of one of her coworkers and lay it over a marketing video they made and she didn't ask the coworker ahead of time and just sent the video to her and i my jaw dropped i was like are you insane like that would feel yeah. terrible you know what if someone one of your employees just emailed you a new promotional video using your voice and you had no idea i mean it personally freaked me out yeah. but i like, I won't be surprised at all with, you know, we have in the United States, like election season coming up. I'm sure we're going to see this technology and, you know, full effect in good and bad ways for sure. But I think it's, it's cool, but there's a lot of risks for people that like their livelihoods depend upon their like or image or their voice. Like, I think it's definitely gonna be a challenging, you know, few years until some of this gets reined in. I think also some like governments have no idea what to do with this at the moment. Yeah. Right? It's racing ahead of, of law. I was just sitting in on a webinar where um, a guy from, I think he has, he works in AI with both IBM and the United Nations. He said Japan ruled on some copyright issues saying um, anything generated by a machine, even if it's a human that's prompting it and co-creating with it, what's generated by a machine is not copyrightable. Huh. Which seems to get changed, I you know I think in right. this, this day and age. <laughs> so, now, the same respect on the flip side, I think that um, I believe this is the case, but like Morgan Freeman, for instance, I believe there's some people like actually got ahead of this and have actually like licensed their voice for mm, use, right? So I, th I think with some of the, like the new stuff that's happening with the strikes and things like that, I think some of the smart talent will start to like you know learn that you know maybe I should actually license my image or license my voice, and that's actually better than people you know wanting to steal it. Um, and that, that, ha that's happened to music a lot. Like you think of like modern music, 
um, there's always for a long time, it's something called sync licensing, right? So when you, you hear that, um, that jingle or that hook from another song from like 20 years ago, mm-hmm. generally that artist, they sync licensed that for their song. So mm-hmm. there is a practice of that happening in music for like many years. I think it's just going to have to be adopted into other entertainment fields mm-hmm. where it just becomes common practice. And that's how people, you know, potentially like artists will actually make more money, right? If they can figure that out, right? I- if if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you might notice that I have like light bulbs flashing all over my face right <laughs> now. Joan, Joan is awful, I'm sure. Like no, one. but um, wasn't there like a you know J Lo insured her butt or something like that? I remember like a decade ago this being a thing, and I'm like. Are they going to, you know, can actors start insuring their voice? So if it is stolen or used, there's some type of compensation for that. So that was definitely will. It definitely will be. I'm sure (laughs) that was the idea that was going off in in my in my head. Um, Actually, I'll tell you this. So um, back in 2021, I was hired uh, to film a Verizon commercial as a real customer. Um, It never, uh, it never came out, unfortunately, as much as I tried to like tell the search engines that I was trying to purchase Verizon Fios to see if the ads would come up. I (laughs) I never found it. Um, But I do remember that the contract, uh, I had a discussion uh, with this, the, the production team because the contract actually said I was releasing the right for them to use my likeness in whatever ways yeah. they wanted to. Right. Yeah. So you you and I and then I also remember a friend who represents an artist whose drawings were used in a movie and they wanted him to sign away the right for them to do anything they wanted with Hmm. that artwork without paying extra and it was a real battle to negotiate well i think it's going to change i mean like i've been in like involved in some form of like you know video production or media for most of my career and that was pretty commonplace for someone signs a release and i think most people traditionally would think of like okay the release is so you can use it for like marketing for that thing i was working on now i think the whole world's changed right because you know especially like think of you're an actor right you don't want to give away that early on to somebody where then they are, you know, a bad actor, pardon the pun, but like an agency or studio decides to like, I'm going to monetize your brand for the right. rest of life. And, oh, you've signed this piece of paper, so it's okay. So, yeah. but I think that's some of the stuff too, the government's going to have to step in because if you think about how many people have signed those agreements, you know, yeah. in the past, um, and I think the world is just changing with AI and all that, that something's got to happen, you know, to right. protect those people. Whew. It's a big, it's a big one. So you yeah. mentioned before we wrap up this segment, you mentioned that the, you think that the writer's strike is wrapping up. What do you, what do you know? I, th- I think that, well, what they've saying is that they've come to agreement. I think it ends, um, you know, given where we're, when we're recording in the next like 24 hours, I think they're going to end it. Um, I don't, okay, it's not so a whole lot I've seen as far as like what has been fully agreed upon, but actually what I think is a lot of it has to do around AI, right? A lot of the things, concessions that they were able to make is about um, residual rights. You know, like for instance, if, you know, things are used on streaming, you know, does a writer, you know, get funds for that? I think actors are going for that as well. So, um, and hopefully too, a lot of the shows that have been kind of suspended and definitely mm-hmm. start seeing some of those shows coming back here soon as well. So those residual rights, it, that's kind of, There's the AI, which is, can you take my writing, my likeness, my voice and use it however you want? And then the licensing was also a big thing that's part of this, these strikes, because so many production studios and distribution channels have become vertically integrated, Mm -hmm. uh, right? Netflix produces and distributes it. The writers and the actors don't have kind of a, a view into 
the distribution, the views right. and the residuals and are claiming they're not getting paid on all of their residuals. Right. Uh, and that's very much a technology issue, a result yeah. of kind of the disruption of streaming services. So uh, yeah. what does that, do the studios have those analytics and they're just not sharing them or, because you know, we know in the tech world yeah. that like, just because you have that data doesn't mean you have the insights. Right. Yeah. It doesn't mean yeah. you're processing the data and producing insights for anyone to act on. So do they yeah. have that data and they're just hiding it? Or I mean, you definitely have, they have, I mean, you definitely I mean, think of like, um, take like Netflix, right? They definitely have more data than probably like think of terrestrial, t terrestrial TV, right? <laughs> Where yeah. you're, ba you're maybe hoping Nielsen ratings, you know, yeah. give you something like clearly they know everything about us just like anybody visiting a website. Um, my understanding is like just reading like with the, with the current like strike information is that the data, the deals were basically being done by the studios and the streaming companies, but there was no rules in place to expose that data, you know, to the actual artist or residual rights. And so my understanding is that that is what one of the things they've agreed to is now there has to be transparency. There has to be reporting, um, there, which I think will, you know, power a lot of creators where, you know, if they create some show and it's getting distributed on five different streaming platforms, um, I think today they, they had no exposure, you know, like uh, I think it was, I uh, forget the actor's name, but like Breaking Bad. I think it's one of the actors that basically said that he hasn't seen hardly anything mm -hmm. from residuals that are on streaming. Um, I think they should, right? Yeah. If it takes off. And, right. um, so I think it's a good thing, but, you know, there's definitely no question they have the data. The question is, you know, transparency and sharing that data. All right. Well, I am glad that uh, they're coming to a resolution that hopefully this data will be shared and they will be paid. I think what I had heard was, you know, I have more insights into my YouTube content than Issa Rae has into Insecure, right? Yeah, that's probably true. Sad but true. What? Sad but true. Yeah. yeah. So, but you're right. We can do better with our work with with those insights as well. So, yeah. that brings us to our next and final segment, deep dive. So, in this segment, we get more into the details of the business of entertainment, which we just started talking about, and also the career pathways into the multiple verticals within this industry. So if the strikes are ending, maybe aspiring writers feel a little more confident pursuing a job in this space. So Rob Yellowbrick just launched a certificate course titled The Business of Entertainment in partnership with NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Maybe you can first explain how and why Yellow Brick partners with both academic institutions and private brands to develop these courses. Yeah, so maybe you guys have back a bit of like, you know, why did we do what we do and to do partnerships? So um, most of my career has been in kind of the tech and education kind of intersection, um, both in, you know, private brand education that had nothing to do with like an academic institution. And then right before Yellow Brick, um, I was an executive for Cornell University's um, online education programs. And what kind of felt was lacking is that, you know, to one of the questions you asked like earlier on here was, um, is like traditional education, like think universities relevant for the workforce? And I think a lot of times there's a notion of they're not current with what's going on in whatever discipline or industry mm -hmm. that's there, but the brand is inc incredibly respected, right? And then you have these other kind of organizations, like an example, like Masterclass, mm -hmm. which obviously is, you know, very well known for having like celebrities um, or people that are experts in their field, you know, more kind of talking head than teaching. Mm -hmm. um, what Yelbrick was is like, what if we blend the two together, right? Rather than look at the world as it's, it's either this option or that option. What if in a category like film or entertainment, we work with uh, top three uh, film school, which is NYU Tisch School of Arts. And then what if we also brought in senior executives from brands like Netflix and AMC and Warner, et cetera, okay. blend them together. So it's best of both worlds. Um, so they're learning from really great faculty. They're also lear learning from people that are actively in the industry and doing that. And so uh, example, like the business entertainment program is that's a program that basically unpacks how the business of entertainment works. It covers a lot of the issues we were just talking about of um, how does distribution work? How does licensing work and IP? 
Uh, how do you actually get a script to get accepted? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you then get that actually produced in, in one of those cycles? So a lot of that, like that program's designed to kind of help that person who is either trying to break into, say, the entertainment business, or there's a lot of people that, you know, they stumbled into the entertainment business. Like, I, like I'm betting with, with strikes that happen, like a lot of writers are thinking, maybe I should be more on the business side, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe I should understand the business side better. Um, we kind of design these programs for all those types of audiences. Um, and I think what's unique about us is that when they do complete the program, now they learn a lot of relevant current information. They also do get a certificate of completion that comes from a top ranked school, um, right. which I think in the education realm is that, let's face it, a lot of people still to this day um, need and want the validation that they can put on LinkedIn or put on their resume to basically show like, I didn't just like take this like non-branded, non-respected education program, but this is from something that's actually respected. Um, and so we feel like that's very important. Um, the other flip side I'll say too, just kind of complimentary, we also own um, something called Animation Mentor, yeah. which is an animation school. Mm -hmm. And that school is designed for people that may have you know, determined, like, I definitely want to be in entertainment. I definitely want to be in animation. Um, you can think of it as more like a finishing school. So for that school, basically what we do is we take students and they, they're working with professional animators that are working at Pixar and Disney, Sony Imageworks, et cetera. Um, and they're working actually on real projects and real portfolios so that as soon as they graduate, they have an opportunity to actually enter the workforce. So for that side of our business, um, I'll give you an example, like across the Spider-Verse that you know, was out this summer, we have at least like two dozen alumni that worked on that film. That's amazing. Um, and so our, our business, we kind of like do a full spectrum, right? It's from entry level people that just want to break in to business people, to people that are basically looking for that, you know, last, in education, it's called last mile. Yep. What's that last bit of education you need that'll actually get you that job? And that's what right. Animation Mentor does. Well, Animation Mentor seems to take advantage of the kind of, it's an apprentice model. Yeah, exactly. Almost, yeah. Right. And that's been around for ages. Uh, yeah. And I definitely see a lot more kind of apprentice training programs and surfacing those, those programs as an up platforms surfacing those programs more yeah. um some of the like if you're talking about the trades like in construction or manufacturing uh plumbing or whatever some of them people can get paid to do the apprentice yeah. uh, training and i definitely think that the real world applications are crucial to a student's development and would love to see more of that at the undergraduate level. You know, yeah. I I got to do a um, program my fourth year of college with the with the National Transportation Safety Board um, and, and work with them on regional transportation collaboration. I know it's so sexy of a topic, but like <laughs> I actually worked with consultants and people that worked in the yeah. government. Um, and I was only, you know, 20, 21 years old. And so that sure. those types of opportunities, I'd love to see them in all other kind of academic disciplines, not just engineering. Agreed. Well, I think we we talked like very early on about, you know, the relevancy of like traditional education workforce. That's where I think that schools will adapt. You know, I think it, and if and that's where like companies like Yelber come in, like if a school, they know they need to do it, but they don't know how to do it internally. That's where I think there's, you know, Gonna be a lot of like what i call corporate academic partnerships yeah that that bridge that gap together i was gonna say that the that type of par partnership was more ad hoc in a way you know business schools have adjunct faculty members that you know have worked in corporate for decades but want to teach or mm -hmm. a, a professor has a friend that works you know, right. high up and brings them in, but nothing formalized to the way that uh, Yellow Brick is a approaching it. Right. And there, there are some great examples. I think what we're trying to do is um, do it extremely well in the entertainment and creative arts space. Uh, our mm -hmm. focus is definitely more, I'd say, entertainment field. What I would say, too, it's unique with us. And, and it's kind of like some other, you said other fields like plumbing, et cetera. But I think like as we talked a lot about AI in this discussion, what I'm very bullish on is that one of the areas AI, you know, can't really replace and is, I think, always going to have difficulty with is creative elements, right? So despite like, you know, writers and actors and 
and all that negotiating for residual rights. Um, I don't believe like AI is going to fully be able to write a script, right? Or create graphics or like it'll assist with it. But um, that's where I think it's gonna be more need like in fields like we're in is like where like a portfolio matters if you're a writer, it matters if you're an actor, it matters if you're an animator. Um, you need mentorship, you need guidance to do that. And AI might be a tool in the tool chest, but it certainly can't, it's not gonna create an animated film by itself. You know, 100%. It's like one hundred percent, and that's been the overriding kind of insight in across you know the the first thirty or so make sense episodes is just that the AI produces something, but you still need a human to review it and fact check it and validate it before putting it into uh, into action. Yeah, so, so listen. So, what are the new business rules across? the multiple entertainment verticals. This course covers film, television, music, gaming, live performance. What do they all have in common? Uh, I mean, it's 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 kind of that multi, kind of multifaceted answer. Cause I think really when it comes down to it, like let's take, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example because we're in animation, animated film, right? The reality is a lot of people don't. I think as a consumer, you have an idea of the roles that take place, but there's a lot of different roles that are in there right from mm -hmm. the, the concept to the storyboarding um to the financial side of actually fundraising and distribution and marketing and all those kind of things and so we kind of try to break down all those aspects um right. you know part of our mission is that if you're a business person you probably need to have a a grasp on everything so you understand how the business operates but you know also i think like part of our mission is i think there's a lot of people that think like i want to be an executive and a studio, right? Mm -hmm. But that may not actually be the right fit for them. What they really should be is potentially an artist or a writer. And so like for Yellow Brick, you know, we serve the people that have a very clear sense of this is exactly what I know I should be doing. I think there's a lot of people too that don't, you know, they're still trying to find their right fit. And so I think a lot of what we're trying to serve is that if you can actually find the thing you're passionate about, you have natural aptitude and skills for, then you can be successful in almost any pursuit. Um, and even though we are a creative company, you don't necessarily have to be a so-called creative, right, or artist to work in fields like entertainment, creative arts. But you do have to understand how it works, right, if you want to work inside of it. Yeah, I was going to say this earlier when you talked about, you know, that students still want to have, you know, the brand name of, you know, NYU, for example, something they can put on their LinkedIn and I kind of thought in my head, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to add to my LinkedIn that I finished Judd Apatow's comedy course on master class. Right. right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and that's no, no, like no offense to like the quality of it. But I, I think like sure. our standpoint, like you, you're, you're right. Like if you go to LinkedIn, I don't see many people putting master class, no offense to master class. Yeah. But I, because I, I think again, you know, um, well, what you said it's like the, it's more talking heads than having a curriculum design or learning objectives. Yeah, uh, I really did appreciate it. But one thing he said that I want to endorse around, you know, being an executive, being a creative and which side of the entertainment business you want to be on is that, you know, Judd kind of lamented that he wished there were more executives that truly understood comedy because they're the ones that, you know, are top town giving, you know, pointers, feedback, uh, pushing yeah. them in different directions. And sure. he he was like, please, if you're not sure if you want to, if you can hack it in comedy, but you love it, go take those jobs. <laughs> I yeah. need you there. We need you there. So yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, by the way, ironically, Judd is in our film program that we have um, as a contributor, but more on, less on the comedy side and more on like the business side of oh, you cool. know, work as a director. Yeah, I'll admit I'm a fan girl for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I thought his Inside the Actors Studio was really was really great. If you can find find that, I'll so um, I, I can't help but like. Gaming? Okay, I got film, television, music, live performance. Why is gaming included in this? So this is an interesting thing. This actually came out just like um, the past week because um, the game industry, they're contemplating uh, going on strike. But what I think a lot of people don't recognize is that the game industry is 
about twice the size of film, TV, and music industry. I did not. Um, and that's kind of eye-opening to a lot of people. But I, I think last I read, it's it's just under two hundred billion dollars industry, um, which is a little bit over, I think, double of what film is. Mm -hmm. um, I think most people, if you said that, that aren't in the industry, would be really surprised by that. Um, and so that's, I think it's still an industry that's trying to like figure itself out. Like, I think there was a lot of hype around esports, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, things like FaZe Clan went public, huge valuations, all that. I think that's kind of come down a little bit, but I think this general game industry, if you think of like mobile games, you know, obviously there's like the PlayStation games, Xbox games, et cetera. It's a huge industry. And I'd say admittedly, even us, we're figuring out how to crack into that. Um, the right way, because it's also getting very diversified. Um, you know, a gig example like Epic, right. um, you know, they have this whole like Unreal Engine, which is a spinoff of like their core gaming company. That's kind of exploding um, into not only game development, but if you've heard of the term like virtual production, like the Mandalorian and a lot of films are now getting made where it's like a massive LED screen in the background. It's a combination of using 3D backgrounds and you know, like Mandalorian, a lot of it was shot inside of a studio with virtual backgrounds. And it okay. looks beautiful. Um, but if you think of like, you know, the people that are on the set now, you have like 3D artists and, and different things like that. So a lot of these fields are kind of merging and, and gaming is one of the ones that a lot of people just don't realize it's massive. Um, right. And they also don't know how the heck they break into it. So that's where trying to kind of demystify for a lot of people. Yeah, that's awesome. I can see that because, you know, the the art part of gaming is also in animation to yeah. that 3D rendering and using a lot of the similar tools. So Yeah. Well, like I'll give like one example, not going into great detail, but like we're talking about like software coding and engineering. Um, our animation school, you know, the core tool that you have to learn outside of being like an artist, things like that, is Autodesk uh, Maya 3D. Okay. And if you ever seen Maya 3D, it's an incredibly complex software. I'm it sure takes it a lot of training tools, has a lot of functionality, but like that tool was, you know, traditionally used for um, the animation industry, sometimes for gaming, but now those tools are becoming transferable to like virtual production, right? right. So if I'm a Netflix or I'm a studio, I'm looking at how do I produce more shows, lower cost, virtual production is that, that skill set. Um, a lot of people don't recognize how transferable these skills are now. And, and that's where technology, you know, is all the like you know, AI stuff we talked about. It's also democratizing things. But what I find is the issue is a lot of people have no idea, like what jobs exist, what skills are transferable. Sure. That's, that's a big challenge right now where like people say like there's a, a lot of open jobs and nobody's getting hired. I think some of it is an education problem too, that people don't even know that if they were a graphic artist, that by just learning a couple more skills, they could be in the game industry or film industry. So then where can people learn about those job opportunities? Do you well, we do, yes, <laughs> we do a lot of it. You do a lot So if they go to um, yellowbrick.co, so .co, um, we have programs that are basically covering almost every aspect of the entertainment field, um, even including fashion. Mm -hmm. um, side of it. So I would say if like anybody uh, sees themselves as a creative or wants to work in a creative industry, odds are we probably have something covering that. Hey, that's a great place to end. You know, that there are, are plenty of transferable skills and jobs uh, available. Like just go to yellowbrick.com. CO um, to check out those programs. So let's make it make sense. Overall, we talked about, you know, AI in the inter entertainment industry and how that's, you know, brought on the strikes and how we're going to move forward. And, and I love to end on something that people can rest on, which is AI cannot replace the creative element. Um, we're yep, still going to sure. need human ingenuity for that. And that is very important and comforting for anyone that is just really scared of being rendered yep. obsolete by, by the robots. Yeah. With that said, what I would encourage people that it seems as creative is to embrace it nonetheless. I, I think the worst thing you can do is basically disregard it. So that 100%. I usually it. Yeah. Actually, that's great because one other thing to make it make sense is that 
while AI might take over 85 million jobs in the next three to 10 years, I forget what the span is, it'll create 97 million others. So a lot of people, you want to get retrained uh, or trained up and learn these things, like learn how to use all these tools in, in your own workflow and creative process, uh, rather than just clearly ignoring them. I think something like 46% of people try, tried chat GPT once or twice and then never looked at it again. Yeah. So yeah. try again. <laughs> So thank you for listening to Make Sense with me, your host, Lindsay Tavis, and guest Rob Kenyans. We hope you enjoyed our take on the entertainment industry. Rob, where else can people find you online? Do you want them to find you online? Um, probably LinkedIn is the best place. So just uh, type in Rob Kenyans uh, okay. or with Yellow Brick, you'll probably find me, but that's usually the best way. Cool. Cool. As always, you can check out all the links and resources in the show notes. Final note, if you want to continue to be the smartest person in the room, make sure you're getting notified when each episode hits on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button for next week's episode and follow wherever you get your podcast. Thank you, Rob, for joining me. Appreciate it.